Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another special Wargaming edition of The Journey Show. I'm your host, Gideon Marcus, and we have an amazing panel of distinguished wargaming guests here today. First and foremost, we have Lou Pulsifer, a man who needs no introduction because in 1965, he has absolutely no writing or production credits to his name. And then, of course, we have Janice Marcus, who is not only the editor for The Journey, but also usually behind the camera as a moderator for The Journey Show, and she is a very experienced war gamer, and that's why she's here today. And of course, we have Lorelai Marcus, the young traveler, who is also an accomplished war gamer, and that's why she's here today. So as you know, in 1965, war gaming is a burgeoning, new, exciting hobby. And in fact, it is no surprise that our sponsor today is once again, ah, the cameraman has been killed. <laughs> Terrible, ladies and gentlemen, all the humanity. Today's sponsor is Avalon Hill. <laughs> so we're going to get right to what we're talking about today. But first, this news. The 10th and final Saturn 1 rocket mission launched July 30th was yet another success. In addition to deploying an Apollo boiler plate capsule into orbit, it also lofted a third Pegasus micrometeoroid satellite, one of the largest structures placed into outer space. On August 3rd, the European Launcher Development Organization test fired their Europa 1 rocket. Operational missions are scheduled for next year and will create a third full participant in the space race. In American headlines, starting in 1966, American dimes and quarters will no longer be made with any silver content, and half dollars will have their silver composition reduced by half. This move is being made to conserve the national silver supply. In Americus, Georgia, some 230 protesters, black and white, are marching to integrate two city churches. Here, civil rights protesters are blocked from entry at First Methodist. In the biggest expansion of Social Security in years, and despite resistance from the American Medical Association, President Johnson signed Medicare and Medicaid into law on July 30th, guaranteeing government-funded insurance for all American senior citizens. And on August 6th, President Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act into law. The landmark legislation prohibits racial discrimination in the voting process and is specifically aimed to combat anti-democratic practices in the South. In Vietnam news, on August 4th, President Johnson asked Congress for an additional $1.7 billion to increase troop counts and purchase munitions. Draft numbers are soaring, as are the instances of protesters burning their draft cards. Yesterday saw one of the largest American aerial offenses in the Vietnam War, even as South Vietnamese Premier Cao Ki gave the sack to four top generals, including General Hung, who led the military junta after the assassination of Wo Dinh Diem in 1963. In Japan, memories of another war and hopes for peace as the nation observes the 20th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima. And today, 7,500 are competing in the American National Bridge Championship being held in Wellesley, Massachusetts and Hudson, New York. Bridge, of course, is almost as much the national pastime as baseball, with columns on strategy in almost every major newspaper. It is played by more than a third of the American population. And that's today's news. So I'm going to go around the table. But first, I have a question for the audience. How often do you war game? We'll be wanting your answers sent to us by teletype via early bird satellite that we can discuss. But first, I want to go around the table. We, uh, as you know, war games have been around for about, oh, 11 years as an established paper hobby with little counters and such. But it's actually existed a long time before that. 
And Lou Pulsifer is an expert on the early history of war games. And I hoped you would tell us a little bit about what war gaming looked like before 1954. Well, let's first talk about miniatures war gaming versus board war gaming. Miniatures war gaming has existed for much longer, uh, unless you count some of the military games that were played. So uh, we have H.G. Wells, what does he call it, Little Wars, I think, and then uh, Fletcher Pratt's Naval Game and so on. And it's interesting to me that when the British say war games, they always mean miniatures games. When Americans say war games, they always mean board war games. I don't know why that's so, but it is so. Because certainly in America, there were lots of miniatures games. Now, there are fundamental differences between miniatures games and board war games. The first would be that miniatures have to be tactical because you have to play it all out on a table. So you don't have any opportunity to have a strategy or grand strategy. It's all grand tactical at best. Uh, that makes a big difference because it's always been known to good generals that fighting a big pitched battle is a bad idea because there's an awful lot of chance involved. And you see that in miniatures or in board war games where you're depicting a particular battle. There's a lot of chance. Of course, there's a great deal of chance in warfare, period. So um, I never was interested in miniatures for a number of reasons. One is it's loosey goosey. That is to say, you're measuring where units go. You don't have a grid on the table. And I always found that to be the opposite of what I wanted to do. Um, second, in a way, it's really a collecting and painting hobby, not a game hobby. Yeah. Because miniature people like to paint miniatures, and I've never painted a miniature, and... I predict that I never will. <laughs> um, it just doesn't interest me. And so they tend to focus in on things like, what was the color of the buttons on the old guard and things like that. They get lost to me. They get lost in the trees and you don't see the forest. Whereas in board war games, usually you see the forest. You don't have the, the very small level of detail. And... There are lots of board gamers who worry about the designations of particular units and so on, but there's a lot less minutia to focus on. So I've read uh, Don Featherstone's books and he's kind of the, the demigod of miniatures in Great Britain. Um, and I read Fletcher Pratt's book and so on, but I never actually played. So I am biased in favor of board games. And I predict that I always will be as well. Um, so miniatures have been around a long time. Board war games, in a sense, have been around a long time because chess and checkers and even Go are essentially war games. But they have a peculiar aspect to them. There's no chance because you have all the information in front of you and no dice are used. And what that means is they're actually puzzled not games. There is an always correct solution. Now, in the case of tic-tac-toe, you understand you as you grow up, you usually figure out the always correct solution. If you don't know that tic-tac-toe is already always a draw, then you've got problems in terms of playing war games. That's for darn sure. Uh, but on the other hand, checkers and especially chess and even the super especially go are much too complicated for humans to solve the problem. So we know, for example, that in a perfectly played chess game, it will always end the same way, but we don't know whether it will end in a white win, a draw, or a black win. That, that we can't prove. But we know perfectly played, it would always end the same way. Some people would say, well, you've got a two-player game, there's uncertainty. There isn't if you play according to the tenets of the theory of uh, mathematical theory of games. You assume that the other player is going to play perfectly. If they don't, you'll come out ahead. But that's the basis of the mathematical theory of games. And you can only do that when you have perfect information. 
So war games have existed a long time, although when you look at chess or checkers, they look very abstract. You know, the idea is that at one time checkers represented warfare in India, but that was a long time ago. Well, that um, was back when people were made out of stone and were very rigid. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so in that sense, board, games have, uh, board war games have been around a long time. But the kind of board war games we're talking about are a relatively recent uh, occurrence. Now, the first one that I can remember is a game called Conflict. Any of you heard of that? Janice well, has a copy it. of it. I had it and I played it. And I don't remember who published it. It was up to four players. Each player was in a corner of a square board. And you had land around the edges and a big island in the middle and land bridges from the middle of each side to that island. And you had uh, ships, which looked just like the battleship in Monopoly, except you had four different colors. You had um, land units, which are little cannons. And you had air units, which looked kind of like um, science fiction space fighters, strangely enough, on a little pylon. And they could go on land or sea. Now, this was a game that was so old that you rolled dice to determine how you moved. And this is something that's anathema, even in this year of 1965, to real war gamers. It's something that comes out of Monopoly and games like that. So what you did was you managed, you, you arranged your pieces seven away from the closest enemy and then hope for doubles because when you roll doubles, you got to roll again. So it wasn't much of a game, but it was a lot better than nothing. And it did have two aspects that removed it from puzzle. And one was that you could have three or four players and the other was that you rolled dice. Um, then we had American heritage games and there were a number of those. Battle Cry was the Civil War. Uh, Hit the Beach was World War II. Americans against the Japanese, more or less. The one that I really liked which had no dice, but which had uncertainty was American Heritage broadsides. And you had little um, plastic ships that could have one to three masts. And you had little cannons uh, that were emplaced on land. And some of the cannons said hit underneath. Some of them said miss. And only the defender knew which were the hits and which were the misses. And if you sailed past one that said hit, you lost a mast. If you got to where you were next to a ship, um, broadside to broadside, you'd both lose a mast. But if you could get on its T, it would lose a mast and you would not. And that was a really, a really good game. Um, Battle Cry, I never played. I've read the rules and so on, but I've never played it. Um, so that's, that's, that's what gaming looked like before 1954. And then in the 50s, Carol Robert came out with a game called Tactics. And yeah. it was and this is the same time, the same year that uh, Risk and Diplomacy came out. So if so you've Risk ever played... Diplomacy were the non-Avalon Hill ones. Tactics was a very small print run. I never got a copy of Tactics, but the first three games that I got from Avalon Hill were Tactics 2, Stalingrad, and Africa Corps. Which and are all games we're going to be talking about today. Yeah. Tactics... The thing about Tactics 2, the Tactics and Tactics 2, is you'll note, this is what the game board looks like. It uses squares instead of hexagons. And it's not historical, unlike the other most of the other Avalon Hill games. It used the same combat system. But the oddest thing about it, I thought, was that you had your units and set them up in sort of camps to start with. And then they move out of the camps to go fight. And I've never seen that in another game. Um, it worked for Tactics 2, but in games since then, with the historical games, then you set up according to some historical setup or where, where that particular nation was at the start of the war or the start of the battle. I find the fact that the early games used squares very interesting um, and makes sense coming from a, a chess and checkers past. Um, Gideon, can you talk about what the disadvantage of using squares was? He goes another one, yes. So back in the day, squares seemed obvious because, as Janice pointed out, go, 
chess, checkers, they all used squares. But the thing about a square is you'll notice that they're square. And as a result, if you go left or right, it takes a certain distance. But if you go diagonally, you actually travel more, almost half again as fast than if you were to travel up and down or sideways. Now, that's not an issue for Stratego because there is no diagonal. But in Tactics 2, for instance, there is. And so one of the biggest revelations in game design came out with this game called D-Day. What year was that? This is 1961. And what's so cool about D-Day is this is what it has for its maps. So you see it's got little hexagons. And with a hexagon, you can move in any of the six directions and it's equidistant. Um, D-Day also had a very interesting uh, development. Until D-Day, wars were either very abstract, like Lou said, or they were small battle affairs, closer akin to tactical war games than anything else. D-Day was the first real strategic game because you were invading all of France. And not only that, but every game was different because you could choose which beach you wanted to land on. And it could be different every time. And the Nazis had to set up not knowing where the Allied thrust was going to be. So that's really exciting. And the war game hobby has only exploded since then in terms of innovation and, and complexity. Although for the most part, they all use the same combat results table, which is to say that anytime two forces get close to each other, you roll a die to see what the damage was. And they've all used the same chart pretty much to date. Now, I wanna give some other people a chance to talk. So Lorelei, tell us which of the games that have come out so far you've played and which one you've enjoyed the most. Well, um, I've played, uh, I think the most recent one was uh, Waterloo uh, and that was fun. I ended up, uh, because that one has um, both the uh, the French side and uh, there technically is only two sides. There's the French and then there's the British and the uh, Austrian, I believe, um, who are a team. Uh, but normally it's only played by one person, but I teamed up with my mother a against my father. And it was we a still lost. <laughs> it was a, it was a long. You didn't get any extra uh, pieces. And <laughs> and hard lost. Uh, yeah, hard lost game. Hard. But it was a, it was definitely a lot of fun. Yeah, um, we we fought hard, and I have I have won plenty of games too. But uh, that particular one, we we made a, a couple early mistakes that was difficult. Sorry, Laura, go ahead. No worries. <laughs> uh, I of course have also played uh, Diplomacy, which is a uh, favorite in some of my family with uh, my cousins and such. We, we they always want to play it. Uh, my mom refuses to play it anymore because <laughs> um, that that game is uh, you lose a lot of friends if you're not careful in how you play that game. Uh, but I think that one I really enjoy having the uh, discussion aspect of the game rather than just having it all be technical. Um, being able to actually communicate and negotiate, uh, I think, was really innovative in uh, war games and in their, in advancing them. Absolutely. Janice, how about you? Uh, well, as Lorelai said, we we teamed up on um, Waterloo. Um, you and I played Africa Corps recently. Uh, I remember um, conflict from when I was growing up. My dad had a set. Um, or I've played it with my dad, I should say. Um, and, uh, and I remember that one, although I don't remember the, the play style very well, because it was, it was a few years ago for me. Um, and, At uh, least a decade, back when you were in your teens. It, <laughs> yes, uh, indeed. <laughs> uh, well, you know, like Gideon, I am 39. <laughs> <laughs> we? we're all we're all 39 we're today all 39 here um except lorelei <laughs> <laughs> i hope not <laughs> and by uh, the way oh go uh, ahead sorry no no i i don't really have uh uh i don't i don't have a lot to uh to to say as, as far as that's concerned so yeah which which so you've played 
Africa Corps, you've played diplomacy, you've played risk, um, you've played Battle of the Bulge. You're you're pretty accomplished in terms of war games and, and games that you haven't played, you've seen played at length. Uh, which one appeals to you the most and why? That was directed to me. Uh, Janice. <laughs> yeah. That's a that's a tricky question. Um, each each time I play, I you know, I, I sort of have to go back and figure out um, the rules anew because I go from game to game. Um, I don't tend to favor games that have supply, which I normally you would think I would like because I'm a, I'm a logistics kind of person. I like managing the logistics of things. I think if I'd lived in the past, I would have liked being something like a quartermaster. Um, but the way supply is handled in a lot of games is less about uh, the numbers of making sure you have enough of something and more about how your units are affected by supply. Uh, so in, in uh, it was Africa Corps that has the physical supply. And that one drove me crazy because the Germans have to roll to see if they even get supply and you can't attack without it. It's a physical piece you carry around with you. And if you don't have that piece, you can't attack. So, and, and so you could go three or four turns without even getting any supply and then you couldn't do any attacks. It was, it was extremely, um, uh, it, for me, it, it felt like it, it, it crippled uh, the, the Germans in that game. Um, it's terrible. Couldn't happen to nicer <laughs> folks. Hey, now. <laughs> and uh, another uh, another aspect of, of supply that's often used is that it keeps your troops. If you uh, if you have the uh, uh, if you don't have, if your troops are not in supply, then they can't they can't move or they can't attack. There are different different rules with different games, and I find that that very limiting. Um, Right now, but on the other hand, we really enjoyed uh, we enjoyed Waterloo a lot. Um, I, well, and Waterloo what, doesn't have any of those aspects. Waterloo exactly. is a set piece battle. Exactly, and I found the um, I, I thought the, the the strategy was really interesting for Waterloo uh, in terms of the way that you would uh, use your pieces to create roadblocks. Each piece has a what's called a zone of control which we call a ZOC, right, Z-O-C. And how much the zone of control affects other pieces depends on the game. Some are very sticky. You even cross into an enemy zone of control and you can't leave it without attacking. And some are not as sticky. It just, and you can retreat out of it. It depends on the game. And how those zones of control are used is very interesting to me. Um, so I tend to like games that have interesting zone of control rules. And how and uh, and that require you to use your units in an intelligent way to create things like roadblocks to keep somebody else from getting to an objective. Uh, Waterloo had a lot of that, so I enjoyed that a lot. Lou, of all the games that are currently out in 1965, which is your favorite and why? At that time, Stalingrad. The reason that I liked Avalon Hill games is because I was looking for games that required you to think, which your typical family game did not, does not. Um, and also I was interested in history and, in, you know, in the future I end up with a PhD. Uh, so uh, Stalingrad, Africa Corps as well, but the uh, chanceness of the supply system was a, a bit of a problem. It did represent that Rommel was very good at tactics and very bad at logistics. And uh, Napoleon said, amateurs study tactics, pros study logistics. And yet logistics isn't represented in most war games, certainly not uh, miniatures games and, and not many board games as well. Well, and indeed, one of the questions that Erica Frank asks is the functional difference between board war games and other board games. And I would submit there's a few. One is that board games that are not war games, I think war game is a little bit of a misnomer because Avalon Hill has a whole line of games that are sort of in the same thing. They have sports games, they have railroad operations games. I think the big thing about war games is that they model a historical situation and try to some degree to do it with accuracy. So Avalon Hill will tout the fact that they had actual military generals 
on their consulting staff for Battle of the Bulge and for Midway um, and for Africa Corps. I, I'm sure they exhumed Rommel's corpse so they could get that perfectly accurate. <laughs> um, and not and so the rules reflect that. Also, what's fundamental is the asymmetry of a war game. So you play Monopoly or you play chess or you play Clue, um, all of Cluedo, all of these games have a basic symmetry. Everybody starts out the same, whereas there's a basic asymmetry to diplomacy where each person starts out with three units, unless they're Russia, in which the case they start out with four, and they're in different places on a map of Europe and they battle out for an abstract World War I. Um, in the Africa Corps, uh, Rommel's got these incredibly powerful panzer units while the allies have a bunch of stopgap weak units, but they get reinforcements. So eventually they have some sort of force parity with the Germans. This kind of asymmetry is historical because rarely do you have completely evenly matched forces. And the fact is, if you have two evenly matched forces, they shouldn't be fighting and usually didn't. They waited until someone had a distinct advantage. So that, I'd say those, that's what I would think were big differences. Uh, Lorelai, in your experience, what have been the big differences, maybe even just philosophically or game feel uh, between board war games and other board games? Um, I'd say that uh, it, it's, it's a bit funny for me to say because I've been playing war games since I was quite young. Um, but I'd say as compared to board games, uh, board war games sort of have a more mature feel to them overall. Um, there's, uh, there's, I mean, there's complicated rules in, uh, in various board games. Um, but, uh, but overall, like checkers and, and chess, though it is a mind game, you need to have thoughts for it. There's a certain amount of, like you're saying, um, uh, you need the logistics and tactics for uh, war games, and because it's got the historical aspect, it it there's just something more uh, mature about it, where you you have to um, think in more of an, an adult manner, I suppose, uh, for these games, uh, rather than the, a simple sort of childish board game, um, and even even coming from uh, someone who isn't an adult yet. Uh, and has been playing since I was a very young child, I think I, I still had that differentiation. And Janice, your thoughts on that question? Well, I think Lorelai has a good point. The complexity of a war game tends to be higher. I don't know that I would say um, that they're necessarily more adult. It depends on the game. I mean, board games have levels of complexity from Candyland um, or Snakes and Ladders all the way up to Scrabble and uh, Monopoly and Cluedo, as you say. Um, these are all, uh, you know, party games um, uh, that that are, are fairly widely known. Um, anybody can pick them up, um, but there there are levels in them that are, are, are designed for different levels of, of, of uh, age, different age groups. Uh, chess and checkers, too. Um, chess in particular. Uh, teenagers can learn it. Lorelai was playing it just the other day with her friend. Um, but it's uh, it can be played at a fairly high level by adults. Um, but the thing that I think differentiates war games, I, Gideon mentioned that they model a situation. So there's a certain kind of depth and color to war games that uh, party games tend not to have because they tend to be very abstract. The closest I could think of a party game that would have a similar feel would be Monopoly, where Monopoly has um, street names and you know you get two hundred dollars from the bank and these various things happen. But even Monopoly could, in theory, be adapted to different situations, different cities. Um, whereas uh, the Battle of the Bulge models the Battle of the Bulge. Um, it, it can't take that. I mean, you could, I suppose, theoretically take it and make it a, a game about a battle on Mars or something, but it would be a different game and you'd have to take other things into account. And everyone um, would suffocate because that's what Mariner <laughs> Forrest told us about Mars. <laughs> exactly. Um, or on Venus and everybody would be crushed by the atmosphere and boil away. Um, so the, uh, 
the fact that it models a situation is, is a fundamental difference, I think. And whether that situation is you're a railroad tycoon or you're trying to, uh, and which you know, com in a completely you know made up situation, um, I, I, in theory you could have a fantasy game, say based on the Lord of the Rings. Um, <laughs> just throwing out ideas here, uh, which would be, which would, it doesn't have to be a. My my point being, it doesn't have to be modeled on a real situation, but it still models a situation that is goes beyond um, a sort of abstract idea of something. Um, and indeed, tactics too doesn't depict a real situation and depicts re a red versus blue uh, using modern warfare. One of the things I don't like about tactics too is that they are evenly sided, and and the game was less fun. War games give you an opportunity to role play. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think that's a lot of, of the fun of them. Uh, Lou, I wanted to ask you, uh, segueing into one of Jean Paul's questions, what's what how historically accurate are these new games? And what do you think is lacking in terms of their accuracy that you think could be improved over the next couple of years? War games are about generalship, not about war. That's the first thing. There's no fear of death. There's no dirt. There's none of that which caused General Sherman to say war is hell. And so... Have you played against also, Janice? <laughs> hey now, hey now. <laughs> also, real war is very chancy. You know, I don't have Clausewitz's quote here, but it's more chance than... Uh, something you can be certain about. Well, we have the odd thing that people who play war games want to be able to control their fate. They want to feel that if they win or lose, it's because of what they did. Or it's because the dice were bad and they're going to play again because next time they won't roll so bad. <laughs> Never heard <laughs> that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so historical accuracy is really not there. It's a lot more, it's it's a, a decent representation, but it depends on what you call historically accurate. Um, commercial do they represent, do they, war games are not up to being used by the military for a purpose. Let's put it that way. Can they be used by a student of history to get some idea of some of the factors going into a battle and perhaps even to... If it's a good game, and not all are, of course, but yes. So as models of what happened, which of the current titles would you say does the best job? Oh, heavens. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure that any does a really good job. Um, <laughs> the two player games perhaps are more likely to, to fit that because whenever you have a war, it ends up being one side against the other side and yet something like diplomacy is seven players, which I find much more interesting, but it's not real. The, the seven players, once the war starts, it always comes down to two or in extraordinary cases, three. But even then, you know, the Russians and the United States were allies in World War II, even though once the war was over, they were enemies. Um, but why Our enemies, the war goes on Our enemies. no commie pinkos on this show. <laughs> Um, I would I would submit that you're right in that no war game unless it comes with someone punching in your face punching you in your face and throwing dirt on you and maybe shooting at your legs um, gets you the feel or accuracy of a war. But I think there are some aspects that it teaches you that can be extremely valid in terms of understanding what uh, people do when they're trying to come up with strategy. The idea of when frontal attacks are dumb and why you want to flank and when supply is vital and why you should plan for failure rather than always assuming your luck is going to be with you. I think there's a lot of things you can learn from war games, aside from having a lot of fun, but also the nice thing is the what if factor. So Erica points out that if a game were completely historically accurate, it wouldn't actually be a game. It would be a series of rules where you move pieces and they do exactly what they did historically. The, the fun of a game is being able to what if. And I think D-Day is one of the best in terms of giving you what if factors. But even just playing Africa Core, Janice and I have gamed that out. So she's always played 
the baddies and I've always played the good guys. And she has, she's experimented with taking Tobruk early. She's taken, experimented with taking it later in the game. And each one of those is a different what if scenario that you can write countless history volumes about. And I think that's one of the really neat things. And I think a game has to be reasonably historical accurate, have at least some tie to historical accuracy to, to give you that feel. Lorelai, when we were playing Waterloo, did you ever get the idea? Obviously, you had perfect information. You're like a god looking at 10,000 feet over the battlefield. But you had some idea of what it meant to be on defensive ground, what it meant to have troops supporting you, what it meant to have cavalry who were faster, who could block the enemy's retreat. I think in the case of Waterloo, it's not the best example simply because, uh, one, I'm not as familiar with the battle that, uh, or, uh, that it's based on, and also because um, the board is very simplistic and the, the rules are very simplistic. So um, though it, it had uh, situations where like you couldn't traverse through rivers or forests very fast, uh, just the... Uh, the simple nature of the board is, as I'm a very visual player and a visual person in general, actually it sort of took me out of it. It was, we were we were moving pieces on this sketch of a map um, rather than uh, playing out a war. Um, and uh, and so there was, uh, it, it didn't really immerse me. I will say that um, it did, uh, it did teach me uh, a bit about war tactics though um even with the simplistic i could at some points pretend that perhaps i was uh not necessarily um uh, in the war but maybe uh, a general um planning on a simplistic map just uh throwing out ideas for a for a real battle um and real battle tactics well, and John Aaron asks, when do you think it's best to sacrifice historical accuracy for gameplay? Right now in 1965, I think the longest set of rules is like six pages. And then there'll be a battle manual that accompanies the rule set that gives tips and shows you uh, uh, little examples of how the game plays. Right now, no one has really tried to make a super complex game. So, the, so I don't think anyone's worked very hard to create accuracy, except to the point where you get sticky things like Janice was talking about with Africa Corps brings in a whole new level of complexity where you have physical supply counters that you have to expend to do any attacks. If, oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to say, to, to answer that question myself and say that I think the, if you're going to have a game, then both sides need to have a reasonable opportunity to win. And as Gideon says, the, the sides of, of war games tend to be um, deliberately uh, different. Uh, not necessarily unbalanced, but with different starting positions. And you can adjust um, the way that these uh, uh, different sides interact with each other by adjusting, for example, uh, what under what conditions victory is declared um, or uh, by giving one piece stronger units, but a, a, a worse starting position, things like that. Um, I think at the, where historical accuracy is, uh, is something to be sacrificed is if it makes one side so powerful that the other side literally can't win the game. Because what fun is that? <laughs> uh, as Erica said, then you'd just be replaying the, 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 the war all over again as, as a historical reenactment. Uh, to me, that would be the, the the single most important thing is not necessarily to have a, a, a perfectly balanced game, but a game in which each player would have a reasonable opportunity to win if they play the game well. Um, that's my opinion on that one. Lou? There are two ways to design war games. One is as a puzzle and one is as a game. Mm. When you design it as a puzzle, you're assuming that whatever happened historically was, in fact, inevitable. So the players are playing to discover the proper route to that inevitable occurrence. Well, I'm of the opposite point of view. I think that history is full of chance and happenstance. And what actually happened often isn't even the most likely thing to happen. So I strongly prefer games where you can have lots of different things happen you're providing a situation and then the players do what they, they need to with it rather than railroading them to a particular place. 
And again, I don't, until we have some truly complicated game, I've been reading in the general, which is Avalon Hill's monthly organ, um, that some people are starting to create their own war games. And John Paul asked if we would ever create our war game. And, and certainly we have, we have talked about making our own game to model certain situations. We, we've talked about one uh, where countries would play uh, major superpowers and, and, and take over various parts of the earth and do battle with each other. And it'd be very strategic and production based. I'm, I'm not sure when it'll come out, but uh, at some point, <laughs> but, um, but until someone really comes out with a complicated game with 10 or 20 pages of rules, uh, I, I think there's only so much you can say with a six page rule set. Um, so Paul Weimer has an interesting question. I'd like to throw it to Lou first and then go down the line. How viable do you think that solitaire war games would you would be? What an interesting idea. Well, solitaire war games are going to tend toward a puzzle because if you don't have human opposition, it becomes predictable. Uh, and yet a lot of people don't have opponents who they can play. Um, a lot of people don't want to play war games because they don't want to put their ego on the line or they're pacifistic or whatever. Um, so solo war games have a considerable popularity in the future, I think. Uh, and I just want to say, for those of you who wonder, where can I find an opponent? Please understand that there is a Galactic Journey Wargaming Society with more than 100 members. Uh, and sometime this month, I'm going to be arranging a play-by-mail diplomacy game. Um, and we've already gotten a lot of in uh, interested response to that, so we may have to set up two. I'm still working out the logistical details, but it is something that will happen in the future. So if you're interested in receiving our newsletter and talking about war games and just figuring out what it is, or even just seeing Lorelei's wonderful cartoons, um, you definitely want to subscribe to be a member of the War Gaming Society. So back to Janice, solitaire war game. What, what, uh, what situations do you think would, would work for a solitaire war game? I, it's hard to say. I mean, you'd, you'd need to, um, I think you'd need to set it up so that the, uh, there was elements of chance in the opponent um, and perhaps roll dice or have some other kind of randomized uh, effect um, so that the there wouldn't be a, an absolutely predictable set of things that were going to happen. Um, I think that's, if, if I were doing it, I think that's how I would do it to have, have the opponent do, um, but even then if there's an only a limited number of things the opponent can do you don't get you don't get unexpected surprises that you get with um th that you get with with uh, with a human opponent um and of course it's either random or it's set and if it's random then the the opponent may have no sense of self-preservation uh it can't make decisions based on on the best course of action it's just doing whatever the dice tell it to. Um, and if it's set, then it's predictable. Um, and that can, that's, can easily be learned. Any, any person can learn the, the pattern and then work to beat that particular pattern. So it's an interesting question. I, I would have to think about what kind, of, uh, what kind of scenario would work for that. Lorelai, can you think of any? Um, well, I'd say, uh, Nothing specific uh, comes to me. Um, it would definitely, I think it, it could honestly be a combination of, of puzzle and game um, in that uh, it's how you, your initial setup of your troops has a, a large effect to the game. And then I'm, I'm not sure how uh, movement and combat would work necessarily because there wouldn't be anybody else on the other side to do movement. Um, and so perhaps it would have to be, uh, you'd have to have uh, some random element of chance like dice rolling um, to see how the sides move and then determine combat if if that combat happens to happen. Um, I can only see it really working uh, is as sort of a very abstract what if. You could take a battle and then if you wanted to extrapolate the randomest of chances and have every single movement be entirely decided randomly uh, and then you 
move in response to that. Um, it could be an interesting exercise, but I don't know that it would be necessarily the same exhilaration and challenge that you get from moving another uh, a player who has dedicated intent happening behind their movements rather than just arbitrary numbers. Well, and I, I will uh, bring in John Paul's question of could a computer ever assist something like this? A few years back, I was involved in a play by mail simulation of World War II. A person had developed their own rules um, and several, several of us played the nation of France in World War II, which was not as forlorn a hope as, as the history books might tell you. Um, and we played in one month turns. And because there was a game master who had, who was the only one with complete information, the rest of us got incomplete knowledge. We had what was called the fog of war preventing us from having complete information. And that's something that every Avalon Hill game, every game that's currently on the market suffers from is you have complete 100% information. So if you had some way of hiding the dispositions of troops from you somehow, right now that's kind of done with dice, right? Because you don't know if someone's gonna win or lose an attack. But if you had some way of hiding it, I can imagine a situation where the computer would have all of the enemy's locations in its mind. And it would act as kind of a referee, only displaying to you the units you could see at any given time. That would be very exciting. Right now, as far as computers have gotten in 1965, uh, they've gotten decent at modeling out some mid-game chess dynamics. We have not gotten anywhere near what was modeled in the Fritz Leiber's excellent story, The 64 Square Madhouse, which I recommend you all read. But someday I can see chess being played by computers. And if you can play chess against a computer, I suspect you can play some kind of war game with added fog of war. And that would be really exciting. What do you think, Lou? Um, do you think that computers could assist with war games or do you think that, uh, particularly playing solitaire, or do you think that the feel of the war game would be lost? Well, consider a solo game. What can the designer do to give commands to the other side, the non-human side. Well, typically in a board game, you use a deck of cards, a deck of specialist mm. cards that says what they do. Mm. And you might draw one for each of several different groups. But there's limits to what you can do with a deck of cards. You can have a few if conditions perhaps, but there's still considerable limits. If you have a computer that can do multiple if conditions and, and choices and so on, then you can make the opponent much more formidable, still hmm. predictable probably, but you would come to the point where if the people who put together the game do not avoid it, then the computer opponent's gonna be so good that most people are going to lose. Hmm. Interesting, so you'd have to put some program, some sort of handicap into the computer. Yes, otherwise, hmm. well, and of course, you could have the computer side cheat, but <laughs> if the computer side is just too good, people are going to suspect that it's cheating anyway. And so that's one reason why the programmers might decide to, in effect, weaken the computer side so that they wouldn't be suspected of cheating. By the way, I see in the audience we have Hugo finalist Tom Burdom, and uh, we have from him uh, sending in his little telegrams to our, to our helpers, um, but I'd love to know what his experience is. And he is a uh, a miniature war gamer, so I'd love to know what he plays and and how he enjoys it. Erica is talking about Stratego, which is a game that Lorelai refuses to play against me um, because she doesn't want to break her three game winning streak. But she says that both players are working with partial information, and that's a fantastic idea, Erica. I hadn't even thought of that. But the, the cool thing about Stratego is you play on a board and you have your pieces arrayed in front of you. You can see what unit you have in front of you, but your opponent cannot. And I think it would be really exciting to have some kind of war game set up. What if you had an Africa core where all of your pieces are on little blocks like these? but only the player playing them knows what their disposition is. And all of a sudden, everybody gets a lot more cautious. I'm reading uh, Winston Churchill's six volume biography right now, autobiography. And he talks about how his commanders in Africa wouldn't, would, would kept over or underestimating the enemy's strength. 
McClellan in the Civil War was famous for that. He always assumed the Confederates had three times as many troops as they as they did. And so if you had a game like that with hidden information, it seems like that's just a brilliant way to do that, where you just don't know what you're going against and you become a lot more cautious and timid. Uh, what do you, are there any games right now that are or any companies that are thinking of exploring that possibility, Lou? Well, the obvious now considered Stratego is actually from 1909. Hmm. Wow. It was called La Talk. It was patented by a French woman in 1909. And it and a number of other games like it, Tri Tactics and Dover Patrol and so on, were published in England and never got to this country. And then after World War II, some Dutch guy added another column and added four pieces to its side, and that's Stratego. So Stratego is a ripoff, but it was a legal ripoff because it was no longer patented. Mm. Um, but the obvious extension from Stratego is to use something like a block. And the original Stratego that I had was actually wooden blocks. With the stuff embossed into it. It was very, very cool. That's what, um, that's what these are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So uh, you could do the same thing with any war game. You could have Stalingrad or Africa Corps and have wooden blocks, uh, although you couldn't have maybe quite as many as is in Stalingrad, and uh, introduce that kind of uncertainty into the game, and it would make the game very different. In fact, you could go to an extreme and have no uncertainty in the combat and just uncertainty in the strength and the location. So the possibility is all there. And another, of course, is just turn the pieces over, the cardboard pieces. Uh, the problem there is you've got to keep looking yeah. at your own pieces. And that's yeah. real pain, whereas with the blocks, you don't. Right. So there are um, a lot of options there for, for hidden information. Uh, I will say that uh, the block idea does have the fault of uh, counters you can stack, whereas mm -hmm. you can't really stack wooden blocks as easily. Um, mm. which I think uh, the, the stacking is, uh, is valuable in, in, in especially much of the game mechanics that are coming out right now, like Waterloo uh, has a lot of stacking mechanics uh, that are crucial to the gameplay. You'd have to have a board that was perhaps twice as big so you could put multiple blocks in a single hexagon. Or you have fewer blocks and larger hexes and just run at that higher scale, so to speak. Or maybe blocks that snap together in some way. Mm -hmm. um, one interesting thing, I, I actually want to turn to the topic of diplomacy for a number of reasons. One, I think it's a very accessible game because it, it, speaking of rules, I think there's only, you can play it with one page of rules, but even the whole thing is just a few. Um, but diplomacy adds that fog of war by having every single player write down their orders on a sheet of paper. Nobody sees those orders until they're all turned in and then someone reads them all out. And of course, that leads to all sorts of fun things like someone telling you that they'll move a certain way and then actually committing a completely different order to paper, <laughs> which is why diplomacy is a game. You have to agree that you will any anything that happens in diplomacy happens outside, uh, does, stays within diplomacy and doesn't come out and do not take a grudge from one game to another. But I want to ask the most important question. I'm going to go down the line. Which two country alliance is the strongest in diplomacy? <sighs> and why and i guess i'll add to that and which one's the most fun to play lou england france or russia turkey and why the, is that the outside powers have an advantage and those are the outside powers the inside powers italy germany and austria are at a disadvantage because they're in the middle and unless the other players use the what i call the invisible hand and recognize that those inside powers need a little bit of a break because they are inside, then they're gonna probably gonna die. <laughs> That's just a matter of geopolitics. So the two outside combinations are Russia, Turkey, and England, France. And which is better? I, I don't know. You know, diplomacy people argue about this constantly, and I'm sure they go for many, many decades. Um, so <laughs> different people have different opinions, but the board is against the inside players. And which which uh, which alliance would you say is the most fun to play? Fun, hmm. Depends on who you're playing with. <laughs> it certainly does. Um, 
I don't know. I don't think I wouldn't think of it in terms of fun. Um, Not diplomacy. Because <laughs> Russia starts with four, if everything goes well, the Russia Turkey can really sweep the board. Now, if that's your idea of fun, okay. You know, I know somebody who likes really close games. I'm of a different sort. I like to know that before the game is over, I've won. <laughs> you know, I want to dominate everything. So different people have different opinions about how it goes. Of course, in a two-player game, if you dominate everything, the other person resigns, and that's the end of the game. But in a game for seven, that's not necessarily the case. Janice, strongest alliance, funnest alliance. Uh, I know you hate diplomacy. It's been years since I've played, but uh, I have to agree, Russia or Turkey. Uh, depends on whether you're Russia or Turkey, though. <laughs> um, I mean... Turkey has to, and, and uh, a Paul Weimer notes, Russia, Turkey, until one betrays the other. <laughs> um, like Lou, the uh, the ability to go in and 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 dominate is is kind of fun when you're playing a war game. Um, so I think it's a fun alliance, um, and just being able to, as I recall, the 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 freedom of movement um, was different for for Russia and Turkey. Though again, it's been quite a while since I've played the game. So I'd, I'd say yes, I agree with that one. Lorelai? Well, my first instinct was to say Russia and Turkey, but that's what everybody <laughs> else was saying. Uh, so, uh, um, Might be reason for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think because Russia starts out with the advantage, uh, Turkey is meant to keep them in check uh, by, by always trying to infiltrate the Black Sea. Um, but uh, but as, once the... If they're not fighting with each other, they become like uh, like Lou said. They just sweep the board um, and become an unstoppable force. Um, I think uh, I think Britain has some potential that uh, that people don't necessarily see because it starts out small, um, but because it has access to all the seas, uh, I think the the aquatic uh, battles and and. and Roots of diplomacy have some untapped potential. Um, I've I've yet to see it, it really uh, used in games that I've played. Um, so perhaps uh, France and and England um, could be pretty powerful too if if they took to the to the seas. Um, and those core center countries, I've actually seen some some pretty strong where um, it if they if the three center countries align and the outsides don't get together against them uh it can be a, a pretty hard nut to crack so i think it really depends on who's playing and and what the the setup of the game is like to the to the point of since i'm 12 years old i will note that the whole point of fleets and diplomacy is not only do they act like armies but they can actually ferry armies as far as you can string fleets in a line um, and one of the funnest moves to do in diplomacy is to go from brest to naples but uh <sighs> Thank you, ladies. I'll be here all week. Um, Unfortunately, but uh, I, I will, I will go counter. I will say the best alliance in the game is between the smartest players. So I, uh, I was my, I think my favorite is I was playing Germany, which, by the way, is possibly the single best country in the game, in that you can force project anywhere. I think Russia is the easiest to win with. It's also the easiest to lose with if you're not good at it. But I was playing Germany, and a friend of mine was playing France, and another friend was playing England. And me and England were going to conquer France. And we were half away to conquering France. And then France came up to me and said, hey, why are we fighting? Next turn, we could completely destroy England. And I said, you know what? OK. And the next turn, <laughs> France was on its last legs. And I caused England to cease to exist. Whereupon the guy who played England re resigned, gave us a nice note saying, thanks for playing, and went to the living room to read. So. That kind of taking advantage of opportunities can happen with any player. I've seen great games with the with the weakest powers, Italy and Austria, Hungary, doing a fantastic job, even against the Russian Turkish alliance. So it all depends on just how you play and how clever you are and how willing you are to talk out of both sides of your mouth. It is also, by the way, able to possible to win diplomacy without lying at all or even talking to anyone and just letting your pieces do the movement. But it's tricky. <laughs> that 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 would be pretty tricky. I think uh, diplomacy with no talking would be a very difficult game. As as long as France understands that the name of the the scene to its north is the English Channel and not the French Channel, we'll all get along. 
All right, with that, I think I'm going to call it a wrap because we're an hour in. However, as always, the conversation can continue as long as you like. You can join us in Portal 55, and the uh, instructions for how to telex into Portal 55 are available on your CRT or teletype printer. And we hope you will join us. We might even be able to convince Lou to join us, um, young curmudgeon that he is. Uh, so I hope that we all had fun here. We all learned something. And I really would love to play war games with all of you. So I hope we've piqued your interest. So with that, any Gideon, parting thoughts? Gideon, I'd like to say that um, I'm hoping Lou will be willing to join us because I know he's got some ideas for a, a war game he'd like to publish someday. And I'm very interested in in seeing a, in, in having an opportunity to ask him some questions about his ideas for that game. Um, I think he said something about it being like modeling of uh, Britain. So uh, I, I think it would be well worth your time if, if uh, you're a fan of war games or if you're interested in the process of creating war games to come to Portal 55 afterwards and, uh, and maybe ask Lou a few questions. All right, and with that, Edward Everett Horton. <laughs>